The Pomo Indians of Northern California are the world's most expert basket makers. To serve their needs throughout life, they created a great variety of baskets, handsome forms with harmonious decoration, baskets for special uses during certain seasons of the year, the handled seed beater and burden basket for harvesting wild seeds, baskets used in special places for underwater, the loosely woven double fish trap, or a small woodpecker trap for use on a tree. For land, a long quail trap. And baskets for routine work. A hopper without a bottom to hold acorn meal on the grinding stone. Baskets for sifting and storing food. And cooking baskets woven so tightly they are used for boiling liquids with hot stones. Baskets for transport. The Pomo baby began life in a sitting cradle. And large wide mouth baskets for bearing heavy burdens or carrying the light fibers for making new baskets. Where other Indians used clumsy or fragile containers of hard and heavy materials, the Pomo utilized light, durable, and expertly made baskets. For basket materials, they depended upon wild plants, since the pomo grew no crops. They often walked far, hunting choice twigs, roots, and bark, vine, and rush. But within their own territory, especially around Clear Lake, they found many good materials. The dogwood furnishes warp rods for twined baskets. Both roots and branches of the white willow provide warp elements and foundation rods. From the rootstock of the sedge comes the most frequently used white weft material. A black weft element is produced from the root fiber of the bulrush. The bark of the red bud furnishes both a red and a white weft material. These are six of the twelve materials used in pomo baskets. All twelve are found near Clear Lake. This Pomo woman is gathering redbud branches in the springtime. Basket materials were sometimes gathered as they were needed during the spring or summer, though they were mostly harvested in the autumn. The bulrush must be dug from the mud of the marsh to obtain its thick root stalk. Only the central column of this rootstock may be used. It will become the black weft element used in making basket patterns. But when the outer coating is stripped off, the central column is a pinkish color. In order to transform it into a velvety black, it must be properly treated. Buried for several months in a mixture of ashes and thick black mud, these pink fibers will change to the rich black. A modern treatment uses a special dye to produce a more permanent black in less time. The roots of sedge are found, with the help of a digging stick, in the deep sandy loam of river bottoms. As with bulrush, only the center of these root stalks of sedge may be used. They will become the white or straw color material of most baskets. The younger branches of white willow are selected for strong, flexible warp and foundation rods. 
and the roots of white willow are dug from the soft sand of river beds. They grow to great lengths, sending up new shoots on the way. These long roots are also loosened with the primitive digging stick. When separated, a strand may run 20 feet in length. The strong, slender stems of the dogwood are tough and pliable, excellent material for the warp rods in certain kinds of baskets. Hazel warp rods are used to a slight extent. Preliminary preparation of the materials may be done near the gathering place. The green stems of dogwood are first stripped of leaves. For some baskets, like the seed beater or fish trap, the bark may be left on, but usually it is removed with the sharp edge of an obsidian flake. White willow branches are also usually stripped to prepare the rods for warp or foundation elements. These rods of willow are the most frequently used. The branches, peeled or unpeeled, are stored in bundles. The long roots of white willow are always peeled. These pliable roots are particularly well suited for the foundation elements in small coiled baskets, as well as the horizontal element in lattice twining. They are preferred because of their great length. After drying for several hours, the roots are coiled for transport, storage, and future use. The root stalks of sedge are first split to divide the central column. Each half will become a sewing or twining element. Peeling off the thick outer coating leaves the pure white center. Properly dried and bundled or coiled, the materials were ready to be carried, often many miles, back to the home village. There they might be used immediately or stored until needed. Soaking in water restores their flexibility. This makes them ready for the last step in preparation. Final preparation goes on as basket making progresses. Willow rods are dressed down to the required size with an obsidian flake. Here a strand of sedge is drawn through a tight loop to remove the tiny fibers that remain after preliminary dressing. red bud branch was split after gathering. The bark is now peeled away from the inner woody fiber. It is this flexible bark which provides two colors of weft material. The outer surface red, the inner surface white. With the obsidian flake, each strand is trimmed to the proper width as its edges are smoothed. Red bud is the only red fiber among the POMO's common basket materials. Two others are black and seven white. In addition, split grapevine and tule stem were used in special baskets. The weaver patiently prepares each element until it is ready for twining or coiling, smoothed, even, and pliable. Except for the obsidian flake, the sharply pointed awl is the only other tool used by POMO basket makers. Otherwise, baskets are made entirely with the hands. Ancient awls were made from the leg of the deer by sharpening the cannon bone. 
Modern awls are made by setting sharp steel points in ornate wooden handles. A starting knot is the foundation upon which every basket is begun, except for wicker and cradle. There are a great variety of starting knots. This is the simplest. Two pairs of rods, crossed and bound with weft. Pomo basket makers develop ten basket making techniques, many more than any other tribe. Six are twining techniques. Of these six, plain twining is the most often used. In this simplified drawing of the basket's outer surface, we see the top course in the process of being woven. The four courses below show completed weaving. In plain twining, a stiff vertical warp rod is enclosed by two pliable weft elements as each winds under and over the other. The pitch of this weaving, as with most, is downward. One weft element is shown in red to demonstrate how it alternates with the second. The weaver holds her work vertically before her, facing the outside surface of the basket. This gives her the best viewpoint for developing its shape and decoration. Plain twining is often used for an entire basket, or it may be used, along with other techniques, in successive bands. From the weaver's point of view, her work is progressing in a clockwise direction, since she weaves with her right hand. Were she left-handed, her work would progress counterclockwise. The flexible weft strands of sedge are passed back and forth between the rigid warp rods of willow. The smooth, rounded surface of each strand is always on the outer surface of the basket. Neither strand is reversed to present its opposite surface. We will now see this one technique in slow motion. The first strand is brought down vertically over the second. Where they cross, they are held firmly with the left thumb. The right hand grasps the horizontal strand and passes it between the rods, dropping it on the other side. The vertical strand is next brought up into the horizontal position. The left thumb now shifts the next vertical rod over. We return to normal motion. In this plate form basket, plain twining has been used around the starting knot to a radius of an inch and a half. The next inch is a band of diagonal twining, which includes the zigzag made with red butt. Beyond this, plain twining is resumed. Diagonal twining differs from plain twining in two details. The pliable weft strands enclose two warp rods instead of one, and successive courses include alternate warp rods, resulting in the diagonal appearance of the finished weave. This gives diagonal twining its name. As the steps of weaving are observed, diagonal twining seems similar to plain twining, with this one exception. Two vertical rods are pulled over instead of one. Wrapped twining is an unusual technique which has the finished appearance of diagonal twining on the outer surface. A single weft element is looped between each pair of vertical warp rods. As it loops behind, it wraps around a pliable horizontal element running along the back of the rods. Viewed from the inside of the basket, the loops of the outer weft element appear vertical as they are drawn tightly around the horizontal element. Lattice twining is more complicated. 
a rigid horizontal rod runs at right angles to the vertical warp rods. This horizontal rod is enclosed by the two flexible weft elements. Lattice twining is often used for an entire basket. More frequently, narrow bands of lattice twining are used to strengthen a basket and heighten its decorative effect. The rigid horizontal rod projects to the right. A willow stem might be used, the same material as the radiating warp rods. But most weavers prefer the root of the willow because of its uniform diameter and extensive length. As the weft element binds this horizontal rod into the basket's outer surface, it becomes a continuing spiral within the weaving, similar to the foundation rod of a coiled basket. Except for the inclusion of this rod, the technique of lattice twining is essentially the same as plain twining. One important use of the awl is to make a hole for the insertion of a new warp rod. The rod's sharpened point must be seated firmly. These additional warp rods need to be added from time to time as the diameter of the basket increases. The remaining two twined basket techniques are three-strand braiding on the left half of the screen and three-strand twining on the right. Three-strand twining is the simpler. A weft strand emerges from behind a vertical warp rod, crosses in front of two warp rods, and passes underneath the other two weft elements. In three-strand braiding on the left, the three weft elements are completely intertwined between successive rods. Each weft element goes over one and under the other weft element to form the intricate braiding. We will see the more complicated technique of three-strand braiding demonstrated. Unlike three-strand twining, which may be used for an entire basket, three-strand braiding is only used near starting knots. Braiding is regularly battened down with the point of the awl to compact its loose weave. The weaver places one weft strand under the second and over the third strand as she passes it between the warp rods. This results in the braiding. The simple technique of wicker is unlike both twining and coiling. In any one course, a single horizontal element passes alternately under and over successive vertical rods. The pomo employed wicker in one type of basket, the handled seed beater. On this willow hoop, the vertical rods of dogwood were first secured with one or two courses of plain twining. With her fingers, the weaver battens down the first rows of wicker work. A bundle of woody fibers is woven into the wicker work in both the right and the left side. These strengthen and help to fill the bed of the seed beater. She is using the pliable bark of the red bud for the horizontal element. The vertical rods are thin branches of dogwood. These unstripped twigs were very often used for both warp and weft elements in the seed beater. Making the pomo cradle is also unlike both twining and coiling. Its many sticks are held with twine in this special way. Each stick is bound to the others by what may be called twin half hitches, made side by side around the vertical rods 
and enclosing a single horizontal rod or string in the center. U-shaped rods form the sides and bottom of the cradle. The back is being filled in with straight rods, which are being woven together by courses of twine. The central string has been secured across the back of the cradle, keeping the two sides pulled together. A course of binding is being tied across this central string, enclosing it as it goes. The next loose rod is pulled over, and the first twin half hitch is looped around to enclose both the new rod and the previous rod. On the opposite side of the central string, the second twin half hitch is tied around the same two rods. With tule padding, lacing, and tump line, the cradle was finished. The simplest coiling technique uses a single rod for its foundation. The pliable sewing element passes over the top of this rod and is threaded through just below the rod of the preceding coil. As the sewing element spirals around the two foundation rods, it forms the smooth outer surface of the basket. The basket maker uses the awl to make the hole for each stitch. She then passes the sharpened point of the sewing element through the hole. The loop is then pulled tight. Three rod coiling is essentially the same as one rod, except for its three rod foundation. Each loop of the sewing element spirals around four rods, the top rod of the preceding course, as well as the three-rod foundation. This interlocks each new course with the completed work. The steps in sewing one rod and three rod baskets are the same. Willow rods form the foundation. The flexible sewing element is sedge, except when designs are added with red bud and bulrush. When a new sewing element is needed, the weaver adds it in this way. After inserting the new element, she draws it through, loops it over, and firmly anchors the end. Following the first stitch, the weaver tucks the old element in against the new one and trims it. She then continues coiling. Feathers adorn the Pomo's finest baskets. Feathers of the varied thrush, the mallard duck, the meadowlark, and the plume of the valley quail. Feathers from the scalp of the red-headed woodpecker and the breast feathers of Bullock's oriole are a few of the feathers of birds used by Pomo basket makers. Each feather is prepared by rolling it between thumb and forefinger to compact the quill end. The weaver inserts the end into the loop of the coiled basket. Drawing the loop tight firmly anchors the feather. With the point of the awl, the feather may be adjusted if it's not properly aligned.
The completed basket shows how neatly the feathers overlap, covering the entire surface. Ornamented with beads and abalone shell pendants, this elaborate ceremonial basket hangs by its beaded string. Homo baskets have been made in a great variety of shapes and sizes, all variations of several basic forms. Globos baskets are one of the most frequently made forms. Shallow plate form baskets are used every day to prepare and serve food. The truncated cone is always coiled and more rarely made. Conical baskets are often bell-shaped. Used in harvesting and for carrying loads, these burden baskets have wide mouths and are often very large. Coiled canoe-shaped treasure baskets were rarely made by any other tribe. Very small baskets have been made as novelties during recent times to meet collector's demands. These are smaller than a quarter of an inch. Of no practical value, these are remarkable curiosities. They are evidence of the basket maker's dexterity. Smallest of all, this basket is not much larger than the head of the pin on the left. Modern giant baskets further demonstrate unusual skill. This one is nearly four feet across. Pomo baskets display a great variety of ornamentation, elaborate and simple. The designs and patterns worked into the baskets with different colors are essentially geometric due to the warp and weft nature of this hard textile. There are seven basic design elements including the straight line. The zigzag, a favorite figure, rhomboids, rectangles and diamonds, and the quail plume. The triangle is the most often used design element. Here it is used in an elaborate superposed pattern arrangement, with the point of each touching a similar point of another triangle. The basic elements were repeated and combined into patterns, which are arranged in one of five ways. This banded design is the most predominant pattern arrangement. Below the border finish are four bands using the triangle as dominant figure in great variation. The large triangles form a white zigzag space filled with small triangles. Rhomboids fill the zigzag space in the next band. A dark zigzag is placed within the white zigzag here. Diagonal patterns are also frequently used. Opposing diagonals combine to make a crossing design. On a few coiled baskets, vertical and individual pattern arrangements appear. Of all pomo baskets, the most exquisite is the sun basket. Each one of these required the feathers from the crests of over a hundred red-headed woodpeckers. Famous and highly prized, this rare ceremonial basket represents the height of Pomo artistry and skill, an expression of beauty by the world's most expert basket makers. The 
This middle finger is a powerful finger. If anybody talk about me from somewhere, if anybody want me to doctor, their loved ones, this middle finger, it shocks like electricity. That is the sign that I am going somewhere to doctor. Then I wait a lot of times. I get ready ahead of time. And it is sure shot. Many times in my home, my children laugh. But they do know it is true. It comes. This is the finger, the one search the body, where the sickness is set, where the disease is setting. The disease that perform in human body, it works like magnet, and it pulls like magnet it pulls you can't miss it many of you know how to fish and many of you know when the fish is touching the bait from the water that's the way it does with this finger from over here and I am going to explain about the disease in the human body. This is my belief, the way I educate myself about the disease in human body. The disease in human body is living. You know why? Because we are living, because we are alive. We are breathing, our heart is beating, and we are feeding that disease because the disease is a living. It's living. But when the body dies, when the person dies, the disease cannot move anymore. It cannot move anymore, it dies itself. That is my experience about, sick, about the sickness. The thing I took out back of its neck, it's like bristle. Someday that would cause stroke. It was dangerous. It's been a danger, that sickness sitting in there. Now it's taken out. I don't know what it will happen. But he has many germs in his body. They hatch it. Germs in the body, it hatches. Just like insects. And a lot of times the congregation wonders. Some of them doubt and some of them believe with their faith it could be done. And the doubters think, I wonder what they do with that, with that thing that she took out, what she do with it? Where does it go? This finger and the instrument that I have in here is spiritual. It's spiritual. When I take out disease, after I put it in the water, it disappears in there in so many minutes. It doesn't stay. It doesn't stay here. It doesn't lay on the ground. It doesn't lay in the basket. It disappears. You don't know where it goes. It disappears. 
because it is taken out with the instrument, spiritual instrument. It is put away. It's not me. Many times I teach the people, those that are watching, do not doubt this work because it is spiritual. You are not talking to me only. You are talking to the spirit also. We cannot lie to the spirit. We cannot lie to the spirit. It's going to happen miracle. It's going to happen miracle and the miracle is not to be shown every day. Once is enough. Oh, Anak-anak kacang, anak-anak kacang.